sample size wasn't big enough. Oh, it's a common complaint among scientists. But what if your population wasn't big enough? In this lecture, we're going to look at what happens when you violate the large population uh, assumption of Hardy-Weinberg and talk about genetic drift. I want you to be able to define sampling error, bottleneck, founder effect, neutral theory, that's a tough one, fixation, and molecular clock, another tough one. Compare genetic drift and selection, such as natural, artificial, and sexual selection. Calculate heterozygosity. To an extent, we're really going to focus more on other things. Uh, relate neutral theory <coughs> to the molecular clock. And answer, are silent mutations under natural selection? Let's dive in. So this is an issue of sampling error. Chance events, not choice. So choice is that artificial selection, human choice, or nature's choice, natural selection. So this is an issue of sampling error. I want you to find that figure, uh, 7.8, and it's got about 100 gametes. It's got 60 that are type A1 and 40 that are type A2. Um, if you were to pick on uh, mostly red ones on purpose, that would be getting all A1. That's how natural selection, artificial selection, or sexual selection works. If it's looking for the red, boom, it's going to very quickly and clearly favor an allele. But I want you to take some time and pick at random. Go along. Go ahead. Pause me. I don't know why I'm waiting. Okay. Um, get a mix. Is that mix 60-40? Can you use a chi-squared test to test if it's 60-40? I encourage you to do so. Did you have a significant difference? If you don't know how to calculate a significant difference using a chi-squared test, that probably hurt you on exam one, and that'll probably hurt you on exam two, so you might want to go work on that. Was it significantly different? Well, I've got about uh, maybe 12 to 24 students in a class. I'm not really quite sure. Um, <laughs> you can tell I'm filming this before. Anyway, um, at random, one of those might have been not 60-40, and that was a sampling error, and that would be something that could lead to genetic drift. So if you were to pick those genotypes, yep, you get a certain ratio. Uh, the sampling error is going to be the random discrepancy between expectations and results. So that's, if there's a significant discrepancy, that's a significant uh, sampling error. Let's look at some examples of this sampling error in practice. First one, uh, oh sorry, these are going to be examples of what's called genetic drift. It's a sampling error that has been applied to a population. So we're going to take a population of mice, and at random, we're going to take some of those and just have them reproduce at random. Now the allele frequency may or may not actually, um, the allele frequency of the next generation may or may not equal the allele frequency of the original generation. If it is significantly different, then we have seen the change in alleles in a population over generations, and that is evolution by genetic drift, chance alone. And since this is chance alone, it's not going to be producing adaptations. Remember, an adaptation is going to be something that is going to increase the fitness of the organism that has it. I realize that's going to be in a later lecture, but still, good thing to know. So how are we violating Hardy-Weinberg here? Well, what happens is this is violating that large population part. As you see at the bottom, I crossed out large population. Genetic drift is easier to see in small populations. If you have 1,000 individuals and 600 of them reproduce, then it's pretty likely that they're going to have all the alleles in that 600. If you have 10 individuals and 6 reproduce, uh, there's a pretty good chance you're going to be losing an allele there. So a small sample size is increasing the sampling error. Remember all those papers you said, oh, there's sampling error there because their sample size is too small. Or when you're working on senior research and your professor says, get a bigger sample size. That's a sampling error thing, but applied to the population. One case is founder effect. Founder effect is when you take a population and you're going to um, you're going to take a subset of that population and move it to a new area, i.e., found a new population. So let's look here at Australia. So we have the Polynesian field cricket here in Australia. It's the Australian feed field cricket, and as you can see, we've got some field crickets that are very much in love. All right, so some of them hop on a boat and they go to uh, what is it? Uh, Viti Levu. Viti Levu here, I'm probably mispronouncing it, it's part of the uh, islands of Fiji, and what you see is you see some but not all alleles are being represented there. Some but not all alleles are being represented there. What's happening is um, some of the alleles, by chance, 
came along for the ride. Others of the alleles, by chance, did not. Now, from that Fiji population, you are going to colonize Samoa. And when you colonize Samoa, there are going to be a subset of the Fiji population alleles present in Samoa. So this is another founder effect. So this is a founder effect followed by another founder effect. Now, how are they moving here? Well, these crickets just happen to be on the rafts of some ocean-going people. So you have in Samoa, um, some of those are going to be going to the uh, Society Islands or to Marquesas. So Marquesas, only one allele made it to Marquesas. Or um, in Hawaii, you have uh, two alleles made it to Hawaii. So this is a founder effect when some of the populations are going to, uh, sorry, some of the crickets are going to make it to the new founding population, and they're not going to represent the full genetic diversity of the source population. Founder effect is when a subpopulation of new individuals creating a new population does not represent the full genetic diversity of the source population. Bottleneck effect. Bottleneck effect is when some but not all individuals survive. In fact, a population is reduced to a few individuals that do not represent the full genetic diversity of the original population. And thus, as a population may grow up afterwards, you may actually end up getting a new population that does not have the same allele frequencies or the same alleles as the initial population because going through that bottleneck reduced genetic diversity. This happened multiple times to bison, probably. So what happened as a, is as the Laurentide ice sheet came down over North America, the bison's habitat was severely reduced such that their population was severely reduced. In fact, we believe this happened several times, that each time the ice sheet came down, the bison population was shrunk, and as they expanded back again, they were able to, um, the, the genetic diversity was not as great as it was the first time. Now, it's one of those weird events where this didn't cause the extinction of bison. In fact, they seem just fine, um, but it is an interesting thing that they can actually still interbreed with cattle. So, um, how that all works genetically is a fascinating thing. This definitely happened with the northern elephant seal, which was hunted nearly to extinction by uh, Caucasian settlers who, um, yeah, took it out, and I don't remember what they needed it for, but food, meat, um, I don't know, nose garments. But anyway, they hunted it nearly to extinction, and then it was allowed to rebound in wildlife preserves. And some species are more able to spring back than others, depending on the genetic diversity that survives in a bottleneck event. So when a population undergoes genetic drift, an allele can go two ways. It can go either to fixation, which is when an allele represents 100% of the population, or it can be, go to extinction, which is when an allele represents 0% of the population. So you have a new allele, and by chance alone, sampling error may reduce it to 0% of the population. That allele has been extinct, is extinct. The other allele is now fixed. So this is going to reduce heterozygosity. So you can see that as alleles get fixed, the heterozygosity decreases, i.e. as a population is inbred, the heterozygosity decreases. It's kind of your how to calculate heterozygosity very loosely there. All right, so we have an allele frequency over time. Drift is going to occur in any population. So in larger populations, you're going to see it occur more slowly. Again, fixation, only one allele for a locus. Extinction is a previous uh, allele for a locus is lost. So we got a small population and a large population here. Start with allele frequency in small populations. Small samples of that small population are going to result in the allele frequency going down or going um, or going up to fixation or extinction relatively quickly. Um, it can wander somewhere between. Okay, think of this as a um, think of it as a drunkard walking on a plat on a narrow platform. So he's going to take some steps, and every step he may get closer to one side or closer to the other side of the platform. 
And eventually, eventually, he's going to fall off the platform. I say drunkard because I'm implying no balance, no, um, this is just random events. The steps are randomly lurching to one side or randomly lurching to the other side. And with a small population, each step is larger because each sample, each random sample, represents a larger proportion of the, you know, whole population. So a small population, small numbers, basically a drunkard walking with very large steps um, on a narrow platform. Eventually, he's going to fall off, and he's probably going to fall off relatively quickly. Whereas a larger population, imagine those as smaller steps. So very small steps may go one way, but just as likely they are going to go the other way. So you're having multiple sampling events that are more likely to just not go to fixation. However, they can go to fixation occasionally. Not in this example. So small population, you generally have that fixation or extinction, whereas larger populations, you generally have it kind of in the middle, which is why Hardy-Weinberg says that small populations are violating the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium because it's more likely that alleles are going to shift over generations. So here's a good experiment confirming genetic drift with uh, Drosophila. What they did was they had 107 different populations, and they're looking at the, uh, the frequency of a different allele. So either 0 or 100. 0, extinction, 100, fixation. Remember, once it hits fixation or extinction, it stops drifting. Once the drunk falls off the platform, he has fallen off. He's not walking anymore. So eventually it has to go either to extinction or fixation. Eventually it has to go there because um, once it goes there, it can't come back. So they took a population of 16 mating pairs, each mating cycle, 32 flies total, and they just kind of put them in a vial and let them do their thing. And then they took the next generation and the next generation. And what they saw here, generation one, you have the alleles kind of, you, you random 107 populations, most of them have uh, close to 50% uh, frequency of that one allele. However, after uh, 19 generations there, after 19 generations, you have, uh, what is it, about 30 that are fixed and 30 that are extinct for that allele. So they, oh, they went that way, and that confirmed uh, that genetic drift occurred. And some of these actually stayed with um, close to 50%, but you know most of them, 60 out of 107, went straight to fixation or extinction. The population behaved, however, more like a population of nine flies. So this went faster than expected. And that's going to bring up something called effective population size. The effective population size is less than the actual population size. It is how the population behaves. Go back to those northern elephant seals. And one thing you're going to remember is that northern elephant seals are polygynous. They have harems. You have a male northern elephant seal who is going to mate with many female northern elephant seals. And many males are going to go without a mate. Thus, the effective population size is going to be smaller than the actual population size because some males are going to mate more frequently than other males. And some males are not going to mate at all. Likewise, some females are not going to mate at all. So the effective population size is really the number of breeding individuals. All right, some terms here. Let's get to, uh, we're going to go to neutral theory now. Neutral theory. We'll cover that, but let's first talk about substitutions. So neutral theory is going to be talking a lot about um, neutral alleles. So let's look at substitution when one allele is going to substitute another. This is when you have a population with... Um, well, you know, alleles present, they're all one allele. A mutation occurs, say, from that yellow to green. Now, that green is going to randomly drift in the population. It could drift out, boom. Like, it comes in, it goes out. Just walk on in, walk on out. And that could be happening with that mutation. However, the opposite is also possible that it could become more frequent in the population. If it becomes more frequent in the population, it may substitute that yellow allele. So that, that green allele substitutes that yellow allele when the green allele goes to fixation. That's a substitution event. We see an, a, a mutation from green to purple as well, and that mutation from green to purple may go to, to fixation as well, so the purple may substitute the green. Now clearly, a deleterious allele, if it substitutes in, what's going to be happening is the whole population will have lower fitness. A lethal allele cannot substitute. No, you cannot substitute a lethal allele in. 
If you substitute a lethal allele in, that implies that the entire population is dead. It doesn't work that way. A deleterious allele shouldn't, but sometimes does happen, and that's an inbred population. You'll see that more often. Substitution by beneficial alleles? Yeah, all the time. We should expect to see a beneficial allele go to fixation pretty rapidly because they have higher fitness. What about neutral ones, though? Well, what about neutral ones? Well, we're going to look here at a genetic drift versus natural selection. So, boo, boo, boo. genetic drift, remember, is that random effect. Natural selection is when things are good or bad. And we're looking mainly at the things that are good. So, in genetic drift, alleles are fixed or lost just by chance, a sampling error. And that means neutral alleles can kind of drift one way or drift another way. They'll eventually go to fixation or they'll eventually go to delete, uh, extinction. In natural selection, alleles are swept to fixation. So this is good. And we move. We move to fixation very quickly. Beneficial alleles get swept to fixation. Deleterious alleles get swept to deletion, uh, to extinction. So we're calling it a sweep. When that, nat when that allele goes very quickly towards fixation or uh, elimination, extinction. So what's more common? Here's a question for neutral theory. What is more common? Neutral alleles drifting towards fixation or beneficial alleles being swept to fixation? Well, natural selection and genetic drift are both active. Smaller populations may or may not see an allele swept to fixation and the selection coefficient will determine how beneficial an allele actually is. So here we have a good, a good graph. We have the uh, two, on the, on the x-axis, the two NES. That means two, which is for diploid organism. NE, the effective population size. And S, the S is what's called the selection coefficient. It's how good or bad an allele is. If the selection coefficient of negative four, what's going to happen is that allele is really bad. So negative is bad. So that's a heavily deleterious allele. It is very quickly going to go to zero. The probability of fixation of a very deleterious allele is effectively zero. If at a selection coefficient of negative seven, if that's two NE S, remember selection coefficients are generally less than one. So two NE S is going, if two NE S equals seven, negative seven, then that allele has no chance really of going to fixation. That is a bad allele. However, <coughs> what if that allele is very beneficial? Well, the probability of fixation goes up a lot. So the probability of fixation is going to increase as the allele becomes more and more beneficial. With uh, two NES of 10, we're talking like wings or something that's really good for a population of sea-going um, ferrets or whatever. I don't know. Ocean-going ferrets with wings. No, oh, it's a nightmare. Okay. But <laughs> somehow it's a really good allele. And um, that's going to go to fixation very quickly. Probability is very high. We're going to come back to some other effects of what happens when things are high selection coefficients later. But what if it's neutral? Well, there is actually a probability that it will go to fixation. It's a not negative. It's actually, you know, round one. So the probability is possible. It's, it's possible that it will go to fixation if, even if it's a neutral mutation. It's not not going to fixation. It's not going towards extinction. And that gives rise to neutral theory. Neutral theory is that effectively neutral mutations that rise to fixation by drift alone vastly outnumber beneficial mutations that rise to fixation by natural selection. So basically for fixation, neutral is much, much more common than beneficial. Why? Well, one, re one rationale is beneficial mutations are very rare. Remember the, the previous lecture where we discussed the four types of mutations. Lethal, okay, those are never going to fixation because they kill someone. Deleterious, okay, there's a selection against those. Neutral, meh. And beneficial, they actually make things better. So how often can a protein be improved by the substitution of one amino acid? That's a good question. How often can you make a better watch by just randomly tinkering in it? 
How often do you do something that is neither good nor bad? So if you do something that is neither good nor bad, these neutral mutations are going to come to fixation more often, largely because muta neutral mutations are just more common. So it's more common, neutral more com mutations are more common than deleterious, uh, than beneficial mutations, just like deleterious mutations are more common than beneficial mutations. And what we're looking at, too, is this synonymous versus non-synonymous um, mutations. So that's a term we're going to need to know is synonymous mutations. Synonymous mutations are when you don't change an amino acid. So this rate of fixation, uh, the, number, so the number of nucleotide substitutions that result in the synonymous mutations and don't get, you know, axed, is 13.05 times 10 to the negative third per site per year. So per, um, you know, genetic code bit per year. Whereas non-synonymous, ones that are actually going to change things and don't result in something that is deleterious or lethal, is 3.59 times 10 to the negative third per site per year. So non-synonymous mutation from valine, uh, from leucine to isoleucine is probably a neutral fixation in regards to the individual's uh, fitness. Remember, leucine uh, and isoleucine are both uh, nonpolar amino acids. A synonymous mutation is going to make leucine turn to leucine. So, yeah, so even within this, we're going to see more synonymous mutations go to fixation than non-synonymous mutations go to fixation over a, over a certain number of, amount of time. Okay. Uh, this quote here is from Zap Brannigan. There's this uh, neutral planet, so uh, the neutropolis, you know. What makes a man go neutral? Lust for gold, power, or were you just born with a heart full of neutrality? I love Zap Brannigan. Okay. How do you test this, though? Okay. Let's look at pseudogenes. Pseudogenes, as you may remember from a previous lecture, are when you have a duplication of a gene. One of those genes is being transcribed and is functional. One of those genes is not transcribed and is non-functional. They should evolve solely as a result of drift because there is no selection, neither for nor against, mutations in a pseudogene. Silent sites should change faster than replacement sites for most loci. So think of um, parts that are not being that are being transcribed but not translated. So um, introns, for example. Neutral theory can also exist as kind of a null hypothesis. You say that okay, is there selection for this gene? Well. Is it greater than neutral? So is there actually positive as opposed to just zero? Is there negative? Well, there's selection for that. Is it positive? Well, there's selection for that. Or is it effectively zero? In which case, it's similar to neutral. All right, molecular clocks. Molecular clocks are a way to test and use neutral theory. So molecular clock means that the uh, neutral mutation rate should vary as a function of generation time. So there should be, if we looked previously, a certain number of nucleotide substitutions over each time. So number of nucleotide substitutions per unit time should be constant if neutral theory is true. So if these are just random mutations that randomly go to fixation in a population, we should see a relatively stable number of mutations go to fixation in a population over time. Okay, we can test this. But there's a problem here. So long-lived organisms generally have smaller populations. Um, think here about uh, orangutans, macaques, and chimpanzees. They're longer-lived organisms than mice, chickens, and uh, western clawed frogs. Zebrafish are very short-lived organisms. And you think of these organisms, you're going to see that long-lived organisms have small populations, short-lived organisms have large populations. In a small population, genetic drift will occur faster. In a long-lived organism, with long generation times, genetic drift will occur slower. In a short-lived organism, genetic drift will occur faster because there will be more generations. In a larger population, genetic drift will occur slower. So this balances out, actually, such that mutation rate actually varies as a function of clock time, as in years. So if we see the divergence time between, say, humans and zebrafish is very high in the number of synonymous mutations or synonymous substitution. So we see that at the top of the clock around sequence divergence per site of 1.4 over 400 million years. 
However, at uh, five million years, we see a divergence rate that is relatively small for chimpanzees. We can take the fossil record and compare it to the molecular clock. This is one thing where evolutionary biologists and creationists have a bit of a fiasco. A creationist will say, well, you found this fossil in this rock layer, and you said this rock layer must be this old because the fossil's that old, and we say the fossil's this old because the rock layer is this old. See, there's no third way of testing it. Ha ha, I win. Well, you can also say, well, there's a sequence of rock layers, and there's older and younger, and we're comparing that, and they'd say, well, that doesn't count. And you can say, well, there is a uranium, um, the rate, your rate of uh, isotope change, and they say, well, that's fake. Um, so you need a different way, and you can say the molecular clock is a way. So we look to see, does the molecular clock match up with the divergence time we'd expect, given the fossil record? So did birds diverge from lizards about where we'd expect dinosaurs diverged from lizards? If so, if they have around that number of um, mutations, then we can expect that. We'd expect even that birds diverged from other birds, say um, penguins diverged from um, penguins diverged from ostriches after lizards diverged from birds overall. Why is that important? Well, penguins are ocean and air going animals and ostriches are land going mammal animals. So the creation of land animals like lizards and ostriches should have been at the same time. Whereas the creation of ocean going animals like um, penguins and say uh, marine reptiles should have been uh, later. What was it earlier? Ah, forgetting my days of Genesis for a moment. But this mutation rate serves as another way of testing whether the, uh, when divergence rates occurred in a way of testing the fossil record actually. It matches up okay. Why? Well, because sometimes mutations get higher if there is a population bottleneck or if there are founder effects. So we do have some things that can get a wrench being thrown in the clock. All right, then there's something called codon bias. Codon bias means that not all synonymous mutations are going to be equal. So that is going to mean that certain codons will get transcribed more frequently than other codons. Okay, how does that work? Well, there are not all equal amounts of tRNA in the cell. Some tRNA is going to be transcribed at a heavier rate and is going to bind quicker than other tRNA. Ribosomes may be binding one tRNA more often than another, which means that one codon can be transcribed more than another codon, even if they're synonymous. So you may have one type of codon for valine may be transcribed more frequently than another codon for valine, even if both codons are for valine, one's going to be transcribed faster than the other, thus there is selection for the one that's transcribed faster. Wow. That's a complicated topic. You might want to put a bookmark in that and then go look at the book for a few. Uh, you might want to ask me a question on explaining that more. That's a tough one. Codon bias is a tough thing to grasp. You're going to take one or two times. I took one or two times to get this. Then you have something called hitchhiking. We're going to go on this a few times. Now there are two H's. Hitchhiking. Hitchhiking is when you have a selective sweep. Okay, remember earlier we had that positive beneficial mutations are swept to fixation. Okay, if that happens, what you have is a portion of the chromosome with that allele is under positive selection. Okay, how much selection there is is going to be directly correlating with how big that area of the chromosome is. Remember that each generation you have crossing over. Crossing over is going to mix up parts of the chromosome. If there are fewer generations before an allele is fixed, there are fewer opportunities for crossing over to occur between that positive beneficial allele and a neutral allele. So a neutral allele that is one centimorgan away from a positive allele is going to often travel with it. It's going to travel with it uh, about 99% of the time. We're going to come back to this. You might, if you've taken genetics, review it. You'll need it. Um, 
one centimorgan away, a neutral allele, one centimorgan away from a positive beneficial allele is going to, 99% of the time, travel with that beneficial allele, which means if that beneficial allele gets swept to fixation in 10 generations, then there's a 90% probability that the neutral allele will also get swept to fixation. If it gets swept to fixation in, you know, a, a longer period of time, there's less of a probability that it'll get that the um, neutral allele will get swept to fixation alongside it. So if the um, neutral allele is farther away, or if the positive sweep is not as strong, you're not going to get this um, hitchhiking. But a positive sweep can result in the hitchhiking of neutral alleles. Okay. Now this one's really going to fry your noggin. A positive sweep can result in the fixation of deleterious alleles. If you have a positive allele that has, you know, a selection gradient of like three, you know, big, big, and you have a small effective population. So this is going to go to fixation in three generations. And right next to it is this crap allele that's just deleterious. It's just awful. And it's going to go to fixation too. If it's not as awful as the uh, positive allele is awesome. So you can get fixation of neutral or even deleterious alleles if they're right next to a locus that brings a benefit. Ouch. And there's also background selection with negative selection. If something gets swept out of the population, well then so does everything nearby. And a lethal allele next to a neutral allele, that neutral allele is not traveling to the next generation. So selective sweeps, we're going to come back to that one. Loci, you're going to want to review your chromosomes because we're going to be coming back to that one. But this is how a small population size and genetic drift can result in violations to Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. I want you to review these. These are the objectives we've covered. Make sure that you are able to understand and comprehend them. Are silent mutations under selection? Think codon bias. And please, of course, if you do have questions, I am available in the forum and by email and occasionally by review session to help you out. And I'm more than happy to help you out early than I'd be happy to help you out during the review session because I'd really rather help you out, well, twice. 